He's real in my soul. Yes, he is. Amen. Yes, Thank you. Is. Amen. Thank you, Deacon. It's more. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that wonderful uh, worship selection. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Reverend Harrison. Amen. Amen. Thank you uh, for uh, that wonderful prayer. Amen. Amen. Um, and truly, we are. We are still uh, celebrating. Uh, Welcome Baptist Union. Uh, we are still celebrating uh, the wonderful time that we have there today. Amen. Amen. Right. Uh, glory to God. Amen. 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 As we pray, Amen. Uh, rejoicing in the Lord for allowing Mother Karina Edwards. Amen. Uh, Sister Karina Edwards for allowing her to make 100. Amen. Amen. And uh, so many people that showed up. Amen. Uh, to help celebrate. Right. To Amen. show their love. And it's just a wonderful thing to see um, uh, the patience and the sacrifice even of her children. Amen. Um, amen. To put this thing together. And we want to thank, amen, uh, the trustees as well. In particular, amen, amen Brother Davis, Brother Evans. Right. And we thank you all for uh, helping uh, that come true and uh, come together. It was very smooth. Um, it was a community event. Amen. Amen. Wow. Um, and we just give glory to God today. That was uh, that was joyous. Was. That was a joyous occasion, and uh, we are so grateful to God for keeping her uh, with us. Amen. Um, a Baptist Union, uh, welcome once again. Um, another uh, weekend, another Sabbath. Amen. That the Lord has blessed us with. That we are here. And we are so glad uh, to be able to gather together again to worship the Most High. Right. Amen. And so glad that you are tuning in to worship along with us. Right. Um, thank you uh, for continuing to support Baptist Union. Thank you for continually giving. Thank you for continually praying. Um, and uh, thank you uh, for your kind words. Thank you for keeping in touch with one another. That's right. Um, we need each other. We need sure. each other. Uh, if you have your Bibles, there is a word um, Acts, Acts, the uh, the book of Acts in the New Testament, the book of Acts, and turning to chapter seventeen, the book of Acts. Chapter 17. The book of Acts, chapter 17. By His grace, we'll be looking at this chapter. in its entirety, but for right now, uh, let's go to verse 22. If you haven't said amen. Amen. Uh, Acts 17 and 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, that though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, 
as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance, God went there, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. Let us pray. Most gracious God, our heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you today. Father, Yah, we just want to say, Thank you. We want to say thank you for allowing us to see another day. Lord God, we want to say thank you, Father God, for keeping us as healthy as we are. We want to say thank you that things are as well as they are even now. Lord God, we want to say thank you for keeping us in the midst of a pandemic. We want to say thank you in the midst of a pandemic for supporting us, for providing for us, Father God. You are making a way. You truly are a way maker, Lord God. You're, you're, you're seeing fit that your people are taken care of. And for that, we want to say thank you. Lord God, we want to say thank you, Lord God, for giving your angels protection over us to keep us in all of our ways, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, Lord God. We want to say thank you, Father God, that you have kept us even in this land of our captivity, Lord God. We want to give you praise, honor, and glory, Lord God. Because you have kept us alive. Lord, we give you thanks. We want to say thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on a cross. Lord God, that all of our sins, all of our sins could be dealt with. Lord God, that we could be adopted by you, receive your Holy Spirit, and be a part of your family. To be with you through eternity. Lord God, we say thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for this living word. And now we ask that you would make it come alive before us even now. That you would speak to us, touch our hearts, and soften them. That we could receive direction, correction, encouragement, guidance from you even now. Lord, we thank you. We love you and we bless you. Love you. Because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Two commandments should cause all men to repent and to cry out for a Savior. Two commandments should cause all men to repent and cry out for a loving Savior. Amen. Um, we're here in this um, chapter of Acts, chapter 17. It's an amazing thing about God's Word. Um, It confirms itself, and yet you have witnesses uh, in history uh, backing it up and confirming it. Um, uh, and though things have taken place in the past, just as Solomon said, there is nothing new right. under the sun. Right. The things that have taken place of old, mm -hmm. they're still taking place right now. Uh, and it's interesting. Um, when the Lord shows these things. Uh, even though this took place 2,000 years ago, uh, I find highlights, amen, uh, that 
shows things that we are dealing with even in these days. And in this chapter 17 of Acts, we find that Paul is making his way uh, through Europe, amen, through the Isles of the Gentiles. Uh, he's in, in he's uh, going through Amphipolis, uh, through Apollonia. Uh, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, I'm in chapter 17, starting at verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, he went in unto them, and three Sabbath days he reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening, he was opening these scriptures and alleging through these scriptures that Christ must needs have suffered. In other words, he was opening, opening up before them the Old Testament and showing them uh, places where the Most High had given pictures of Christ's coming and uh, how he would suffer, but also how he would be raised from the dead. Matter of fact, you don't have to go outside of Isaiah 53 to see all of that. Uh, but you are, he was going through the scriptures and showing where God was pointing to Christ that he would be coming. Uh, and that he would suffer, that he would rise again from the dead. And this Jesus, whom I preach to you, he is this Christ. In other words, uh, Paul was preaching to them that Jesus Christ that he was talking about, that we talk about, is the one that the Old Testament uh, was prophesying was to come. And he has fulfilled these things that are pointed to in scripture. And it says, uh, as he taught this, he said, some of them believed, and they consorted with Paul and Silas, uh, and of the devout Jews, a great multitude, and of the chief woman, not a few. So, as he's in the midst of the synagogue full of Hebrews, amen, some of them were able to believe. Uh, and then there were many, a great multitude of devout Greeks in the area uh, that believed. Choice women, several believed as well. Verse 5. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. It says that there were Jews, which when Paul was preaching Jesus, and how he was opening and alleging all through the Old Testament that the prophecies of a coming Messiah, the prophecies of a suffering servant, the prophecies uh, of a mighty counselor, amen, uh, the Prince of Peace that was coming, he was saying that he's preaching that this is Jesus that we have been telling you all about. He is the one that has fulfilled these things. And it says that some of them believe there was a great multitude of Greeks that believed. And it says that there was some, uh, it says there was some Hebrews that did not believe. And when they saw that after the preaching, uh, that this crowd of folk that began to believe, they were moved with envy. In other words, they were envious right. of Paul. And just uh, using, uh, to me anyway, uh, what makes sense to me, it, it wouldn't make sense. Why would they be envious of Paul? Paul preached right. and folk believed. Why would they be envious of If they were uh, just uh, what you call laymen, amen, in the synagogue, it would not matter much why some folk believe and some didn't, but why are you envious? That tells me that these were people in positions of authority right. and power. Because when Paul preached right. and he got fruit from that preaching, that now these folks were envious. They wanted what he had. They were offended that he had such success. That tells me right. that these people that were envious were people in positions of power right. and authority. And while they already had power and authority, right. 
they were disgusted uh, by the success that Paul had. Paul had. That's right. And so it's showing us that there was, uh, that when uh, the word of God is preached, just like Jesus said, Lord knows you don't know, it's just like the sower going forth to sow. He's going to sow it liberally, but you don't have no idea where these seeds are going to fall. Some are going to fall by the wayside. Some are going to fall on good ground. Some are going to fall on the rock. Some are going to fall and take root. Uh, but then when the scorchiness of the sun comes down, uh, they're going to lose their root. You don't know where it's going to fall. And he's talking about the hearts of men. Right. And here we see that when he has preached, it has sprout up a spirit of envy. So there are people uh, that were not concerned with God's will. Right. They're in the synagogue. They're in positions of authority and power and leadership. Right. And yet... They're not concerned so much with the will of God being done because when Paul preached what was the will of God and how Jesus was fulfilling the will of God, they were not happy about it, but they were upset. Right. So they're not concerned about the will of God. They were more concerned with their own power. And so you had people that were concerned not with God, watch this, not concerned about the people. That's right. No. Because if they're truly concerned about the people, and that would happen, that should happen when folk are first concerned about the will of God. That's right. That's because right. God is concerned about his people. That's right. But if you're not if you don't care anything about the will of God, yeah. you're surely not gonna care. About the people. And so watch this. They don't care about God. They're not concerned about the people. They're just concerned about power. power. These. Yeah. Uh, you could say. This is the spirit. Mm -hmm. right. These are the ones. That then went into the marketplace. Of the city. Right. Found men that did not have jobs. Amen. And he. They specifically went to those of the Bible says a baser sort. He, they found lewd fellows. Right. They found vulgar fellows. Right. They found folks that's used to being in the streets. Right. Oh, Lord have mercy. Amen. Right. Watch this. They knew. They knew where these people were. Right. Uh -huh. And apparently And stuff up, but but they weren't in the synagogue. Right. They didn't do their best to get them off of the streets and into the synagogue. But when they needed some, what is the term that is being thrown around so broadly right now? Useful idiots. Yeah. When they needed somebody to do their will, they went out and found these men yeah. Yeah. of baser sorts, yeah. and they stirred them up. Because they are more concerned with power, and they stirred them up against Paul. And it says they turned the city upside down. Yeah. They caused a ruckus all in the midst of the city. Yeah. Lord have mercy. Yeah. Uh, it's a shame. It is. It's a shame. And we're not talking about uh, folks that are of uh, baser sorts. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about these lewd fellows. We're not talking about these vulgar folks uh, that were used to being in the streets. Ain't, ain't nothing wrong with that per se. They're still human beings with minds, hearts, wills, and emotions of their own. Amen. Matter of fact, I'm not, I'm not talking so much about them as much as I'm talking about the ones who stirred them up. Because the truth is, look, uh, it's according uh, to who's doing the stirring. Yeah. Because the truth be told, somebody could have looked at Peter and said he was of the baser sort. He was a vulgar person. Because my Bible tells me that in Peter's appointed time, he let a few choice words right. drop out of his mouth. In other words, it was just natural in him and given the right situation 
what he was used to came up and out. And watch this. And when he did it, everybody said, oh, he's from Galilee. <laughs> like we know how these folks from Galilee act. I wish I had a witness today. But see, the God that we serve, the Lord Jesus Christ, took him that could be considered of the baser sort. And then after he died and rose again and poured out his Holy Spirit, he let it fall on somebody who could be called the base of sword. And now he turned a thug into a theologian and he gave one of the best and most effective sermons ever preached because 3,000 folk got saved in one day. So ain't no shame in whatever place you find yourself because we are where we are but by the grace of God. That's right. Amen. Amen. The Bible says uh, they went and they were looking for Jason because Jason was giving Paul a place to stay. And it says uh, they went to certain rulers of the city crying, these are those that turn the world upside down. They came here also whom Jason has received, these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. It's interesting to me. They accused Paul and them of uh, preaching and saying and teaching things that were contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, right. this King Jesus. But we know that Paul, look, they're accusing him of sedition. They're accusing him right. of rebellion against the government. But all Paul was doing was preaching Jesus. And I find it interesting that over and over again, throughout these scriptures, you will find when men and women stand up for God, right. that the same accusation comes over and over again. They are preaching rebellion against the establishment. They are preaching sedition. They're, 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 causing, they're trying to tear apart. They're speaking against our government and our leadership. They did it to the Hebrew boys when they tried to make them bow down to the image. They did it to Jesus himself. That's You know that's how he got to the cross. They said that he's uh, saying that he's a king. He's trying to go against Caesar. And now you see the same thing happening to Paul. And the interesting thing that goes through my mind is all of these, they got the same accusation whenever they preached Jesus real strong. But many of uh, the current leadership in churches today who say they're preaching Jesus, they would never be accused of rebellion against the government. Oh, you know. Yeah. Look, Paul wasn't preaching that. No. But he was preaching Jesus so strong. He was preaching the authority of God. He was preaching that he's the son of God. And there is a higher authority yeah. that all mankind must officially, eventually answer to. And it was enough that they could use what he was uh, preaching twisted and say he's preaching rebellion. Right. Uh -huh. You got all these folk that say they love, oh how they love Jesus right. and yet they would never be falsely accused no. of rebellion. No, no, no. I wonder if they're preaching the same Jesus. Okay. Later on it said they got him, they had to get him up and out of there. So they went down to Berea and they found another uh, place. It said these uh, noble in here, uh, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica down in Berea in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. They searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed. 
also honorable women, which were Greeks and men not a few. The Holy Ghost tells us that these folk in Berea were more noble than the ones in Thessalonica. Why? Because not only when they heard the word that was preached, they took the time, opened up the scriptures for themselves, Amen. prayed, and they, they wanted to see if he was telling the truth or not. Ain't that wrong with that? I'd rather somebody do that than do what many of us do, which is we hear the word preached, and if I don't like it, I just give it the backhand and go on about my business. I never go to the word to see, is that really what the word says or not? But I'll write somebody off. But they did that. And, uh, but watch this. Even though they did this, when the Jews from Thessalonica had knowledge that Paul was preaching down in Berea, they followed him down to Berea, and the same folk that the Holy Ghost said they were actually acting more noble. They were actually taking the time. They were looking through, and they were open to hearing what I had to say. If you get the wrong folk, to come on down in the midst. Yeah. If you're not careful, they will stir even you up for the wrong agenda. Yeah. Wrong reason. Yeah. Is that not right? Mm -hmm. Amen. That's exactly what we're looking at there. Well, once they had been stirred up, it says that they got Paul out of there. See how Paul gets pushed further and further and further, and he pushed him all the way to Athens. In verse 16, now while Paul waited, he was waiting for Timothy and Silas, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Right, right. Uh, when you approach uh, the then uh, ancient city of Athens. Uh, it's a port city. Uh, approached by water. And uh, history tells us that as you would approach uh, the coast of Athens, before you even got to the coast, farther in, farther much further in from the coast inland, yet uh, you're still in the water, you could see uh, this great Acropolis, that is this raised uh, portion and foundation in the midst of the land. It was raised up and there was a great uh, work. It was one of uh, the great uh, wonders of that time. Uh, sculpture, architecture, if you will, it's called Parthenon of Athens. What does it look like? It looks to me so much like the Lincoln Memorial. It is uh, rectangular in nature. It has columns all around it. But instead, uh, you won't go inside and find Lincoln sitting down. But what you will find is you will find the goddess right. Athena standing tall. It says that she stood about 37, 38 feet tall, and she was there in this structure called Parthenon of uh, Athena. And she was the goddess of war, the goddess of wisdom, the goddess of handcraft. Uh, and they actually likened her to the Roman goddess Minerva. Uh, but she stood and they saw her as the guardian protector wow. over the land of Athens. But what my point is, when you are approaching Athens, before you have even gotten off the boat, before you've made it to the coast, you can still see this often because it's so high and elevated, uh, where they have put this... Uh, it's really a temple, if you will, uh, with this false idol, this goddess standing there uh, that is meant to be protecting over all the providence, the land of Athens. Uh, it's there for everybody to see on full view as you are approaching a goddess. Uh, and actually, 
uh, late, much later on in history, uh, when it came time uh, for commissioning for somebody uh, to build uh, some kind of a statue, something that would represent uh, the independence of the United States. Uh, a man built uh, the statue and sculpted the Statue of Liberty, uh, heavily influenced by this idol, Athena. And so here was Paul, and so he could see that in the distance, but when he went on further in this place, he realized that everywhere you went, they had statues all around. There were idols all around. There were altars all around this land of Athens, and it stirred the Spirit of God in him uh, that the whole land was taken with idolatry. And so, rightly so, when the fire got in Paul, Watch this. When the fire got in Paul, he went right to the synagogue and began preaching Jesus. When the fire got in Paul, he didn't uh, go around and gather folk up to tear up the city. When the fire got in him, he went and to go preach to them the truth of Jesus. Uh, it says... Therefore he disputed in the synagogues to the Jews and devout persons, and he was out in the marketplace daily with them and met with them. Uh, it goes on, certain philosophers, Epicureans, Stoics, encountered him and said, what would this babbler say? He seems to be a setter forth of strange God because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to uh, Areopagus, I guess. I hope I'm saying that the best way I can. Uh, and may we know that was the council, that was the town council, uh, where you would go to uh, establish whether or not you would be given an audience to, uh, for an assembly to make a presentation. And they said, may we know what is this new doctrine that you're speaking about? Uh, because you bring certain strange things to our ears, we know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the strangers there spent their time doing nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That's all they were concerned about there in this land that was full of idols, wholly given over to idolatries. Uh, the only thing that was on their mind all the time was, what is this new thing? Right. They were always looking for a new God. They're always looking to hear a new philosophy. Yeah, yeah. And I'm afraid in this age and time of uh, virtual media, oh Lord, that's all folks are con consumed with. What is the latest thing that took place? What is the latest argument? What is the latest? Yeah. Stuff goes viral. Thank you, D. Yeah. Amen. Wow. Uh, what I'm really, what I'm trying to show is, is not so much a difference. Yeah. We think this is so long ago, but the Lord knows the same thing that was going on then right. is going on right now. Yeah. And Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. Mars uh, was the god of war. He stood on, on his hill and he said, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. He said, you're way too religious. Got a whole lot of religions, but don't have God. For I passed by and I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. In other words, this place was so given over to idolatry. They had so many different gods. And had so many different statues yeah. unto these gods. They had so many different altars unto all these different gods. That they said we need to make an altar for the unknown God. It's as if the folk said we got all these different gods. But in case we miss one. Let's make one to the unknown God. 
Paul sees this and he, he captures the weight of this and he says, yeah, y'all got one to the unknown God whom you therefore ignorantly worship. You don't know him. You ignorantly worship. I'm going to declare to you who he is. The one unknown God that you all have not got a hold of is actually the only God that is. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of this Bible. He is the God that sent his only begotten son so that whosoever will believes on him would, have, would not perish but have, would have the right to everlasting life. His name is Yahuwah. His name is Yahweh. His name is Jehovah. His name, oh Lord have mercy. I want to introduce to you the God that you all don't know. That's who y'all are talking about, that unknown God. And let me introduce him to you. Amen. See, because uh, if you knew him, you would understand because he tells us in his word that he is God and beside him there is nobody else. Amen. He's also gone on to say all the rest are nothing but idols. And he would also be able to tell you from the scriptures that God has revealed that those that worship these idols, they are actually giving sacrifices. They are actually worshiping fallen angels. They worship in demons. See, because there's nothing in those statues. There's nothing in them. Yeah. Whether they made of stone, whether they made of gold, whether they made of brass, there's, they got eyes but they can't see, they got ears but they can't hear, right. they got mouths but they can't talk, they got feet but they ain't moving nowhere. Right. There's no life in them. Right. But there's a demon. There's a fallen angel standing behind, there's a spirit behind the lifeless idol that is convincing, that is deceiving men into believing yeah. that they should worship them. Mm -hmm. That's true. And the God of this Bible says, uh, no, I am the only God. All the rest are idols. Even if they're fallen angels, they are fallen oh. angels. They are not a God. I am the only one. I am self-existent. I am from eternity to eternity. I am the only God. That's what the God of this Bible says. That's right. Amen. And furthermore, he would, oh Lord, he would say the first commandment out of the Ten Commandments, which yes. is, you shall have no other gods but me. And let's clarify that even further. Many, uh, when, when that is preached, when that is taught, oftentimes, uh, when that's taught, Lord have mercy, these days we don't teach it. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. If somebody says it, uh, they're doing good to say that. But watch this. This is what we need to grab a hold of. But uh, when he said that, beloved, he did not say that by himself. He had an introduction on that thing. He said, he's talking because he's talking to the children of Israel. He said, I am the Lord your God. I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt, out of the bondage of Egypt. Therefore, you shall have no other gods but me. And beloved, if we had that understanding, I think things would be a lot different today in how we view God and how we view one another. If we understood just that, that the God of this Bible, yes, the God who gave us Jesus is the same God that said, I am the God that delivered you out of the bondage and slavery of Egypt. Amen. Therefore, have no other gods Amen. before me because I'm the one that brought you out. Right. In other words, if we had that understanding, we would always understand. And that's why he told the children of Israel, he wanted them to always remember, I'm the one that brought you out. Right. But furthermore, anybody who 
out. Anybody who has faith to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in the Father, the God of this Bible, would know that the God of this Bible is a God that saw fit to bring people out of slavery. Not one that wants to keep men there and is encouraged and uh, supporting uh, the mistreatment of those that are in that condition. If, he, if he's shown that he's the one that wants to bring them out of that condition, you better know that if they're in that condition, he's not in favor of them being tortured and tormented. And Amen. That's the first one of the two commandments. Uh, it goes on and then uh, he says, look, the God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made of hands. He dwells in the bodily temples of those that believe on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and have received him as Lord. And has received his Holy Spirit. Amen. That is where God dwells. Lord. Neither. 25. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands. This word worship here is different from any other time that it's used in the New Testament. All the other times that this Greek word was used. It had to do with healing. And I said Lord what does that mean? Why is it only used here this one time? What a healing What's that got to do with worship? What are, what are you saying all the other times it, it had something to do with a deliverance, with uh, a setting uh, right what was wrong, with uh, bringing a cure to uh, something, uh, health, some malady that had taken place, some sickness. And then the Holy Ghost revealed to me is the best way that I can understand it. God, there's no place in God's heart that is being touched. Because, look, we are his being, we are his created being. He created us to worship him. Right. But there is no spot in God's heart that is touched, that is delighted, that is satiated by men making idols out of him. Any statues that are made to give a picture of him, that is not the way he wants to be worshipped. He does not. Then I said two commandments. Here comes the second one. The very second commandment. The first one is you shall have no other gods but me. And the very second one is and you shall not make any graven image of anything in heaven, of anything in earth, of any animal, man, whatsoever. Do not do that. Do not make an image and call that me and begin to worship that image. Because how can you form an image? Because God cannot be contained in an image. And the moment that we try to contain him and, and to, to look like a particular, because Lord, he is the God of all living, but the moment that we try to place him in any particular box, we are limited who he is. And we have now shaped, changed, cut off, and turned our understanding of who God is. We have now shaped it according to who we think. Oh, I wish I, 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 
I wish this, this could be uh, clear. I'm doing, doing the best I can. He, so that's the reason. Remember, when he came to Israel, when he first introduced himself at, to them as a nation, and when he came down, he made sure, he reminded us, he said, when I did that, I didn't come to you in any bodily form. I did not want you to recognize me by how I look. I wanted you to recognize and hear my voice. Because if you can recognize my voice, you can always hear my word and you can always be directed in the way that you should go. Amen? He says, look, the same God uh, that did these things, he said, look, verse 26, he has made of one blood all nations, that's all ethnicities, of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. In other words, there's only one race, that's the human race. Right. And out of one blood, he made all these different ethnicities, yeah. but he made all these different ethnicities out of one blood. There's only one race, the human race, but he likes variation. Don't say God don't see color because he likes to see color. He likes to see all kinds of colors. And what he wants is all kinds of colors to seek him. Right. Right. To press out, to find out who he is. He wants all mankind Amen. to search, learn about Jesus yeah. Yeah. so that perhaps they could be saved. Amen. And if we are in a religion, not unlike them, they had several religions. If we are in a religion that somehow tells us that there's a human race but there's one people that are not a part of the human race. In other words, there's a people that are less than. Mm -hmm. You got the wrong God. Wrong God. You're not in this word. That's right. The wrong God. Yeah. And I know I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your patience. Pray with me. And we're about through. I'm coming to the final point. You know what? We wouldn't even be having this conversation about white Jesus if we were really concerned about pleasing God. Yeah. Right. Amen. You're right. If, watch this, because if we were concerned about pleasing God, we would see that second commandment, you shall make no graven image of me and begin to worship it. That means he didn't want any white Jesus. He didn't want any brown Jesus. He didn't want any yellow Jesus. Come on. He does not want that. That's not the way he wants to be worshipped. He wants his people to hear his voice. And I am not for the <laughs> preachers. I am not for the tearing down of all these statues. I am not for the tearing down of all these monuments. Because mm -hmm. none of those things are going to fix the problems, the very real problems that need addressing. That's not going to fix. Matter of fact, I think that's making it worse. Because actually, one of the reasons why we are, uh, folks are so distraught, one of the reasons why they're so torn apart, is not because that statue is up there. It's because you forgot the land that you live in. Somehow, you got drunk off America's Kool-Aid you believe the lie that they told you, and that is the reason why they allowed Obama to be elected. I said it just like that. So that they can have one up there in that seat 
And from the, from the first day of office, now they can say, now ain't no more racism. Now don't talk about you being mistreated because we got one of y'all. And regardless of whether or not his administration actually benefited you, Oh, Lord, I'm going to get in trouble. Yeah. No, Regardless of whether or not uh, his administration stopped the kind of things that we're protesting about now, yeah. they can still set him up as an idol and tell the lie that America's come so far. It's come, it's, we've done so, so much. And why are y'all still complaining? No, no, you should not have forgotten. You should remember. Keep the statues up so you remember exactly where you are. Keep the statues up. So when God begins to tell all men to repent, they already know why. Very clear. Don't tear down the evidence of the things that have been done wrong. No, don't take away the evidence. Leave it up. Leave it up. Leave it up so you'll be sure, watch this, so that you won't run to the one who's hurting you and tell him to stop hurting you. No, so that you will know I ain't got nobody else but the Lord. And the only one that's going to bring us out of this thing Lord. is the Lord. Right. Yeah, I'm going to go there. I'm going to take it back to old times. It was good enough for grandma. Right. It was good enough for mama and daddy. Good enough for me. It's good enough for me. Right. Why all of a sudden now we want to experiment, go after all these other gods, false, idol, fallen angels, in these last times, all of a sudden. Well, he didn't do nothing for us yet. Y'all been praying to him? Yeah, folk been praying to him for a long time, and that's the reason why your dusty butt is still alive. Not because you're so great, not because you're so much smarter, not because you know better than mama and them. Yeah, I hear them praying to that old white Jesus. They weren't praying to white Jesus. They were praying to Jesus. Right. And he must have heard their prayers. Because yeah. if you really be true and look back over your life, I don't care how successful you are, you know you didn't get there just because of you. Right. Right. That means you had some super... Natural. Yeah. Amen. You're right. And the same folk, oh Lord, our own family members that we dare look down upon and say, uh, hmm. No, you need to get some of what they had. Amen. You're right. Hmm. He is the only, he is the only true and living God. And if anybody has brought us safely this far, Amen. it was yeah. him. Amen. And so, and I'm through, these two commandments alone should cause all men to repent. What did Paul say? The reason for the law, the reason for the law was so all men mouths, mouths would be shut. That is the reason for the law. It's there for us to see our own sin, where we fall short according to God. But it's a good thing, because once you know you got sin, you ought to know you need a Savior. So these two commandments alone ought to cause, it ought to cause all of America. And that's what he's calling for. He's not just talking to black folk. He's not just talking to white folk. He's, not, he's talk, calling for all America at this time to repent. Yeah. To seek his face. To call out for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
At the end, there is coming a day, there's an appointed time when God will judge this entire earth. He's going to judge it in righteousness. But he's judging it in righteousness by his son. And Paul says that all men who have his son, right. you ought to be encouraged. You ought to have some assurance to know if he rose him from the dead, that means he did a finished work with your sins. That's right. And so you have reason to have peace that passes all understanding right. when you think about that moment. But if you're thankful for the one who made that moment possible, the Lord Jesus Christ, right. then you also, while we're still here on this side, you are to want to walk in ways that please him. That's right. That's right. So true. There may be one. There may be one that does not know Jesus in the pardoning of your sin. If there's somebody that has never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, won't you come forward at this time? Won't you pray this prayer? Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe God Almighty sent you to die that all my sins might be judged in his body. Lord, I am a sinner. I'm in need of a savior. Won't you be my Lord? Fill me with your Holy Spirit and begin to teach me how to walk in ways that please you. I thank you. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to his holy name. Amen. Hallelujah. Make sure you get a Bible. Make sure there's somebody, amen, there's somebody, the Lord will send somebody your way, somebody that can help you understand this Bible. The best person, after all, is the Holy Ghost. But he'll send somebody to help give you understanding. Thank you, Lord. Let us stand right where we are. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to gather. Thank you for the great celebration of our elder, uh, Mother Edwards, Lord God. Thank you for blessing her. Thank you for allowing us to see the faithfulness of God. Thank you for allowing us to see that you will reward those that are planted in the house of God. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and we thank you for your grace. We are pleading the blood of Jesus over all of us, over all of our families. Lord, we're thanking you ahead of time for keeping us from this virus. We are thanking you day by day. You are protecting your people. And for that, we give you glory, honor, and praise. Thank you for giving your angels charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ for saving us. Thank you. I was headed to hell, but you allowed me to hear a word of faith about Jesus. And now I am saved. I have been translated from the darkness into your marvelous light. And I want to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I'm no longer walking and living by myself, but now you are with me. And you're with my whole family by faith.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, Lord, we love Thank you. Thank you, Lord. The Lord bless Thank thee you. and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Go in peace today. In Jesus' name, amen.